Welcome to another abbreviated service of Redeemer Church at South Hills. As you can see, this week I'm not in Addie's room, or her studio, she likes to call it. She kicked me out of there, so I'm here in our living room. I've taken over the living room, and I've kicked everybody else out of here. But I am very thankful for the opportunity to bring you God's Word on this day. And I'm glad that you're tuned in. Boy, it's um, really been difficult these last few weeks, obviously. Um, it, it's been hard also on me because I really miss our congregation. I really miss being together uh, with our folks. And, and so I am thankful for this opportunity. Opportunity, At least we're able to do this. However, I long for the, the days that we could be together as one in person. So um, with that being said, we're going to get on with this week's service. And our scripture reading is from Isaiah 55. If you remember, I read from this passage last week. I'm going to do the same thing this week. I may continue to do that because it's just such a wonderful passage that offers great hope and consolation and, and peace to all those who seek the Lord. So Isaiah from uh, the 55th chapter. Hear God's word. The Lord says this, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Well, let's turn to our God in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you so much. We thank you that you are almighty God. And even in this time of uh, extreme difficulty, insecurity, fear, you are a solid rock. You are sovereign God. Your hand is in this, Lord God, and we look to you. We look to you for comfort. We look to you for care. We look to, to bring honor and glory to you, Lord, even as we delve into your word. We pray, Lord God, that you would be honored, glorified, your name magnified, for you are the creator, the sustainer. You, you give life, Lord. You take life away. You are almighty, righteous, holy, infinite God. And we praise your holy and righteous name. Lord God, I ask that you please forgive us our sins and our trespasses as we bring them before you, Lord God. Your word tells us as we confess our sins, you are faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we look to you. We look to you at this time, Lord, especially. We see how frail we are, Lord, how susceptible we are, how change can come upon us suddenly. And Lord, we look to you, for you do not change. You have all things in your hand, Lord God. And in you we find comfort. In you we find peace. In you we find hope. And in you we find salvation and eternal life in your son Jesus. So Lord, I ask that you please bless this time. Bless this message, Lord God. I pray that you would be with me to bring forth your words. And for all those who hear, Lord God, that they may be edified, encouraged, challenged to grow in their faith, to look to you and to lean in on you, Lord God. So bless this time for your glory and for our good. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. We are going to continue our study um, in John's Gospel, and it has a lot of relevance for even things that are going on around us. If you remember um, last week, we looked at the end of chapter 3 and the beginning, or the end of chapter 13 and the beginning of chapter 14, and we saw Jesus telling his apostles that he would be going away, and where he's going, they can't come, at least not at that moment. And we talked about how that really rattled them, how, how it really shook them up, how, how, how that fear set in and that uncertainty and that bewilderment. And, and Peter was saying, Lord, why, why, can't, why can't we go with you? Why can't we follow you? Why can't we come? And Jesus, knowing where their hearts were, knowing that they were troubled, 
set out the plea, as you remember, said, stop letting your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So, so he gives that command to trust him, to believe in him, that he is sovereign over all things. Remember we said last week, it's not about our circumstances, but it's about his presence in and power over those circumstances that give us that peace and that comfort. And then we talked about his great promise that he's going away to prepare a place, to prepare a room for all those who love him, and he'll come back and bring them to himself. Again, in that promise, there's not a guarantee that this life will be easy. It'll be smooth sailing, far from that. But it is a promise that we could hold on to as we look to him, as we face the troubles of this world. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble, but take faith, I have overcome this world. So we continue on in our study today, and, and questions persist about being able to go with Jesus. So there's still uncertainty, there's still concern on the part of his disciples. So we'll read John 14, verses 1 through 6, very familiar verses to many of you. Please hear the word of the Lord. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Again, may God bless the reading, the preaching, the hearing of his word this morning. Thomas asked the question, kind of picks up where Peter was last week. And so, so you can see kind of the, the fear, the uncertainty permeating through, through, through the 11 that remain with Jesus. And, and Thomas asks them, you know, how can we know the way? If you're gone, how can we come with you? You know, are, are you kind of leading us? Where, where are you going? How can we do this? So, so we see, see that they're still shaken. They're still unsure. They're still confused about what's going on. And then Jesus makes a statement. This is perhaps, well, it's absolutely one of the most profound statements in all of scripture because it speaks to the heart of Christianity. If somebody asks you what Christianity is all about, quote John 14, 6. Tell them that. Say that to the people because it really encapsulates the essence of the Christian faith. As Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, in the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. So, so it contains the way of salvation, the way of hope, peace, comfort, joy, victory in the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus goes on to say, listen, I am the way. And that's where we want to start today. We're going to kind of break this down. We'll just unpack the passage this morning. Jesus says, first of all, how do you know the way? I am the way. And that's good news because that means that there is a way to be saved from our sins. There is a way to get to heaven, right? And to stay out of hell. And that is through Jesus Christ. Notice, he doesn't say that there are many ways. It's not just one of many ways. It's not just one of several ways. It's not even just one of a few ways. What Jesus says excludes any other way to be forgiven from your sins. To be saved from your sins. And of course, it's very controversial, absolutely, because it excludes every other religious system, every other philosophy that's out there, every kind of new age thought, you know, finding your own way, looking your own path, you know, trying to, trying to reach nirvana, trying to do this, trying to do that. It excludes all that. And there are two big reasons why, and here's what I really want you to understand. I really want you to get this. Two big reasons why Jesus is the only way and excludes all other potential ways. Number one, all other religions, all other religious systems, all other ways of attaining spiritual enlightenment, nirvana, heaven, are based on some form of good works, are based on something that that you do in order to earn favor, in order to merit something, um, in, in order to, to get to a certain place. See, here's what I'm doing. I'm doing the best that I can. 
Right? I might not be the greatest, but I'm but I'm trying harder. I'm doing better. I'm improving. Right? And so it kind of rests upon us to do our part, to do the best that we can, to do the things that we can do, to do good works, whatever that might be. And it's kind of a, a system of, of works and different religions have the different things that you need to do in order to get to a certain place. But you see, that's where Christianity is completely different. Christianity isn't about what you do. Get that down. It's not about what you do. There's nothing that we can do to please God, to make him love us or to earn salvation from him. Even our righteous deeds are nothing but filthy garments before him, the scriptures teach us. It isn't about what you do. It's all about what Jesus has done for you. That's a big difference. That's what you need to understand. That's what you need to, to get into your heart of hearts. It's what he's done for sinners like us. He lived a perfect life. Life that we can never live. He lived a sinless, holy, righteous life. Not one sin. He paid the price that we can never pay. Have him cross at Calvary by shedding his blood. He died the death that we deserve to die because of our sins. He was buried and he rose from the grave on the third day. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. That's Christianity. That's a big difference. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. In the book of Ephesians, we're told, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. Even the faith with which we believe in is a gift from God. It's not a result of works, so that no one may boast. See, there's no one good enough. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how good you are. The things that you do, because of our nature, because of our sin, we need God's grace. Praise God for that. We're not saved by our works, because if that was the measure, if that was the standard, none of us would be saved. So that's number one. Number two, and this is so important, and I don't want you to miss this. He's the way because we have sinned against Almighty God. See, we need, as sinners, we need to be reconciled, we need to be made right with, to come into right relationship with God the Father. That's really important. See, we don't need to be reconciled with Buddha. We don't need to be reconciled with Allah. We don't need to be reconciled to Mother Earth or, or to the universe. We need to be reconciled against our Creator, the one whom we've sinned against, the one whom our offense is against. So we need to be saved, reconciled to God the Father, and the only way is through God the Son Jesus. That's so important. That's when Jesus says, I am the way. That's it. Uh, that's why. This is why he's the way. John 3.16 says, this is why the Father sent him. Again, probably the most well-known or at least one of the top five most well-known verses in all of Scripture. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have what? Everlasting life. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we're told that there's salvation in no one else, right? That excludes any other way, any other system, any other philosophy, excludes that. There's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We're told that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the way. He's the only way, but it's more than that. He also says, I'm the way. And I am the truth, the truth. Fundamentally, this means that he's the source of truth. In other words, truth is inherent in him and it flows from him. He cannot lie. Everything Jesus says, affirms, teaches, promises is trustworthy and sure and absolute. There's a purity, there's an integrity, there's an honesty, there's a reality. He is the sinless savior. He is the truth. Now, how many of you people know Somebody who's really honest. And there are some people that, that just are. They're, they're, they have integrity and honesty, and it mirrors this about, in terms of, about God, but it never matches it. See, it just mirrors and shows us that we're created in His image. So, so you do know some honest people, and you might even trust them, but check this out. Even the most honest person harbors some very dark secrets, some dark stuff in their hearts, don't they? Even the most honest person has lied at some point. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God, not Jesus. 
When Jesus says he's the truth, it speaks to his unchanging nature. He is the truth. That, that's, it doesn't change. Lies twist and turn and transform and change. The truth is steady and sure and unchanging. It speaks to his impeccability. That is his faultlessness, his, his flawlessness, his, his irreproachable. It speaks to his holiness and his righteousness. Jesus is the truth. Truth emanates from him. And we learn truth by him. That means that you can trust him. You can trust his word. You can trust his promises. The big question is, do you? Do you trust? Do you believe? Do you have faith in him? Do you really believe that he is the truth? Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and finally he says, the life. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Apart from him, there's only death, ultimately. He is the source of life, he's the author of life, and spiritually, apart from him, you remain dead in your trespasses and sins. Again, the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, tells us, Paul is, at this point, he's speaking to Christians, those who put their faith in Jesus, who converted or trusting him now, and he's speaking to them uh, initially in the past tense, and he says, and you, you're Christians now, but at one point before you believed and trusted, trusted Jesus, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, among whom we all formerly lived carrying out the desires of the flesh, body, and mind, and were by nature children of wrath. See, we were children of wrath. But when by grace you place your trust in him, you go from death to life. You're spiritually dead, now you're alive. Uh, the scripture calls it being born again, or being born from above. Or, or say, you go from darkness to light, lost to being found. Blind to now seeing. As a matter of fact, Paul, when he was talking about his conversion before a king, um, quoted, told the king what Jesus had said to him um, as, as Jesus was commissioning Paul. And from Acts 26, 18, Paul is being sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins in a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus is the life. Right? There is life in him. So if you're trusting in him, if you believe in Christ, now your life has real meaning. Now it has true purpose as you're serving your king, as you're living for him. And he gives you that abiding peace. I mean, it might come and go when we wrestle with it, but... If we're in him, he promises to give us his peace that passes all understanding. We have great hope for today, not only for today, but also for tomorrow. And it's not necessarily because of the circumstances that you're in. All these things that that, that are um, true about us in him. Circumstances may be very difficult, even as they are right now, even as they are at this time. It's not about them. It's about your position in Christ. And that's what's so important to get. That new life that you're in him. Positionally, you are in Jesus Christ. And there's great comfort to know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That you belong to him and he belongs to you. That's what's important. And he sees us through all these difficulties. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. Every other way is a lie that leads to death. Now, I have to say, John 14, 6 is extraordinarily provocative because of its exclusivity, just because it's so exclusive, just because it's so dogmatic. Because Jesus said, well, there's no other way. I'm the only way. You need to believe in me. Right? That, that really gets a lot of pushback. But just to be sure that Jesus is saying that, we, we see it in a couple ways. We know that because, for one thing, of the definite article. Notice, they've been saying, Jesus is the way, the truth. The life, not just a way, you know, or a life, or, or a truth, or one of many. No, it speaks to the exclusivity of Christianity, of the gospel of Christ. This is one and 
only. That's kind of the idea behind it. So sometimes you see those athletes uh, during sporting events, and the players will come on, and you know they'll, they'll have their name and what position they play, and they'll talk about where they went to school. Up and, and when you hear the guys, for instance, from Ohio State, they'll say from the Ohio State. So there's that exclusivity, that that one and only. Okay, that's the idea here as well. The second thing is the claim when Jesus says that no man comes to the Father except through me, that's through faith in him. When he says no one comes to the Father but through me, again, that's just kind of exclusivity. It excludes everything else any other way. That's a universal negative. That means that no one, not even one person, comes to God, receives salvation, except through faith in Jesus. That's what he's telling the disciples, that's what he's telling us, and that's what he tells the world. So, when we think about this, this is both, the statement is both an offense of the gospel, but also the very hope of the gospel itself. So it's an offense, right? Why is it so offensive? Because people are offended when you, offended when you tell them this. When you say that there's no other way, that Jesus is the only way of salvation, that you need to repent of your sins, that you need to believe on him, that you need to trust in him. People, people push back on that. They push back against that. They fight it. They reject it. They reject you oftentimes. Here we are as Christians coming with this message of hope. We have the antidote. We have that which saves us. And we're offering it in love. And we're telling people to, to turn from their sin, to trust in Jesus Christ. And so often, what do we get? Push back. Go away. I don't want to hear it. How can you say that? I'm offended by that. Right? So many people say today, even people that I talk to, very often I'll say, look, I believe that anyone or everyone who sincerely practices their particular faith, whatever it may be, will be in heaven. That's an inclusive, inclusivist. And that includes um, you practicing your type of religion or your philosophy and eventually getting into heaven. Just do the best you can within that context and you will be in heaven. That's very popular today. It's becoming more and more popular, but it, it's a direct in direct opposition to what Jesus is saying here. It's a direct opposition to Jesus' claim of exclusivity, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. It doesn't matter if you're over here and you're practicing Buddhism and you're a good Buddhist. It doesn't mean you're going to be in heaven because that's a twisting of true religion. Same with Islam. Same with all the other religions and philosophies that are out there. This is an exclusive statement because our only hope is found in Christ because of what we talked about earlier. That he is the only way. There's no works involved. We can't do anything during our salvation. And he reconciles us to the God whom we have sinned against and whom we're indebted to. So, because uh, the truth is that he is the only way. He is the only one. Salvation apart from him is impossible. And so there's an offense to that on the one hand. Yet on the other hand, it's the only hope that we have. It is the, He is the hope. In Christ, when we trust in Jesus, our lives are transformed, our minds, our hearts, our attitudes, how we view the world, how we view different situations, how we view what's going on even now in the world around us today. So, in Him, as we trust in Jesus, here's, here's, here's the payoff, here's what, um, here's what our lives look like in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of trials, in the midst of temptations, in the midst of, of, of the hardships that we face. When we face trials, when we face tribulations, worries, fears, loss, uncertainties, illness, even death, we face it with the sure knowledge of and full confidence that we belong to Christ and he belongs to us. You see that? There's nothing that can separate us from his love. It's Jesus who loves us and gave himself for us. Jesus who promises to never leave or forsake us. Jesus who cares for us, protects us, leads us, guides us, directs us, keeps us, sees us through this life, and welcomes us home in the life to come. That's the love of the Lord Jesus. So in him, as you trust, I mean, as you as you trust and, and as you believe in him and, and, and seek to live for him, fear is replaced by faith. Again, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be afraid at times, but you're going to have that faith, and you're going to call upon him. You're going to be trusting in him, so that that fear is replaced by, by trusting Jesus, by faith. 
in him. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you and I will look to you. Uncertainty with reassurance. When we don't know what's going to happen, we don't know what's going on, but we know that he does. And so we trust in him and we rest in him and love him. Cowardice or being afraid all the time is replaced with courage and boldness in Jesus. Worry replaced with peace. Apprehension replaced with calm. Restlessness with contentment. Doubt replaced with confidence. Loss replaced with gain. Jesus is reassuring them and he reassures us. And the thing that we need to ask ourselves as Christians, as those who say we truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we've rested in him for our salvation, do we really believe and trust him to see us through? We trust him for our salvation. Are we trusting him in our sanctification? And be becoming more and more like him. Do you really believe and do you really trust? You need to wrestle with that. You need to, you need to ask yourself that. Do you allow your, your, your fears and your doubts to overwhelm you? See, there's great comfort here for those who believe. Great peace, hope that Jesus gives. Don't let Satan rob you of that. He's trying to, to take that away from you, to get your eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted to sift Peter like wheat. We're told that he goes around like a prowling lion, lion seeking those whom he can destroy. He tempted Jesus in the wilderness. He's always trying to tempt us and get our eyes off of Christ and give in to our fears and give in to our worries. Don't let that happen. Don't allow the world to distract you from the fact that we belong to him and he's sovereign over all things. Again, we can get so caught up on the world. What's going on in the news? What's going on over here? What are they saying over there? And where are our eyes going? Off of Christ and onto the world, which leads to worry, to doubt, to uncertainty. And we get distracted in that way. Don't allow the world to distract you from that. And refuse. Refuse to let yourself be dragged into worry, fear, and doubt, but rest in Christ. Rest on his promises. Rest on his word. Trust in him. Like we say we do. For Christians, this is this is who we are. This is what we do. We believe in him. We trust in him. We take him at his word because he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He's totally trustworthy in all that he says. He loves us more than we could ever know, and he has all things in the palm of his hands. So don't doubt. Trust in Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you so much. Thank you, Lord God, for your overwhelming love, for sending your precious son Jesus to do for us that which we could never do for ourselves. Thank you for sending your spirit to take out the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, to open our blind eyes, to unstop our clogged ears, Lord God, to to give us uh, renewed minds and renewed hearts to live for you. So as we trust in you for salvation, let us trust in you for sanctification as well. Let us lean into your precious word and take it for what it's worth. Take it at, at face value, what it says, and who we are in Christ and our position. It doesn't matter our circumstances. It matters who we are in Christ and what we are to you. So, Lord, I just pray that you would give us in this time of trial, in this time of concern and fear and worry, that you would give us your peace that passes understanding, that you would give us boldness and courage to speak your precious word into the lives of people who need it most. Lord, I pray that we would take this opportunity, even with all the difficulties and sadness and hurt that it produces, to preach life, to preach hope in Jesus Christ, to, to be with the one who takes away all pain, sorrow, death, tears, and brings us into glory and gives us joy, that nothing can separate us from your precious love. So give us that boldness, Lord, and help us to be strong all the time, but especially in these times, Lord God. So I do pray, and I pray for my precious congregation, that your love would be shed upon them, that you would keep them safe, healthy, and strong, that you would be with our, our leaders, Lord God, and those who are on the front lines of the virus and confronting it and um, working with what's going on, Lord God. Please be with them, keep them safe, protect them, and just pray that you would um, bring therapeutics, bring vaccinations, keep people safe, from this Lord. So we lift this up to you and thank you and praise you that you are our God, that we can trust in you, that we have you, Lord God, that your love 
and will never leave us. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I'm just so thankful for him. Um, I do have a, a few announcements before the benediction. Um, first thing is, you need to know that we had some technical difficulties while recording this. So there might be a little change toward the end of the sermon. We had to re-record a portion of it, so we're trying to put that all together. So please bear with us as we do this. We're, this is new for us, so we appreciate your patience with us. Also, pretty excited about this. On Wednesday night at 7 p.m., we're going to have a virtual prayer meeting. Uh, Benny has sent out the information on our uh, email address, the same place where we get our prayer requests. So check that out, and if you want to join, come in at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, and, and it'll just be uh, a time of prayer. We'll have scripture reading, and then I'll open in prayer. We'll leave it to to people to pray as they feel led, and then somebody else will close at the end of our time. So it'll just the good old-fashioned kind of prayer services, um, the Wednesday night prayer meeting. So, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, also, I want you to know, in addition to praying for you all and thinking about you, um, I'm trying to keep in touch, trying to touch base with you through phone calls. I really, really miss you guys. I really do. Um, it's hard not, not seeing you, not being with you. Um, just makes me appreciate uh, so much what the Lord has given to us as a church family. So trying to touch base, like I said, by phone calls, text messages, some emails, so things like that. Just just to make sure um, that we're ministering to you the best way that we can, especially at this time. Also, again, a few people have asked about giving to the church, how they can give their offerings. You can do that very easily, three ways. You can give online. That's easy enough. Just follow the instructions at the web page. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, you, you can mail your offering to Andy Tulai, and his address is in uh, our directory. Um, and if you don't want to do either of those, you can hold on to it, keep it till next time we meet, and, and hopefully that will be sooner than later. So just want to say thank you again for uh, taking time. Pray that this message goes to your heart. And I do pray so much that the Lord gives you comfort through this and, and encouragement and courage. Just like the apostles, they needed that. We constantly need that as well. And, and the Lord is pleased to provide that for us. So think on these things through the week. I'll be praying, of course, for everything that's going on. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be back next week. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you right now, today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen and amen.